Bismillah, alhamdulillah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon everyone. We greet you with a prayer. We wish upon everyone internal, external tranquility, peace, and serenity in your heart and in your homes and in your marriages and in your families and in your communities and in your societies and in this beautiful country. Everyone say Amin, Amin or Amen. Amen. So we thank everyone for coming here. Is this anyone's first time in a mosque? Woo! Oh, round of applause for those who showed up. Seriously, seriously, seriously. You guys are the winners today. You guys are making this a success and a victory for all of us, for all of us today. I applaud you, I commend you, and I thank you, and I thank you. You know, I'm born and raised in America, in Chicago, lived in Orange County, so we share a house, and now here in Northern California. But I also had a little stint in Minnesota. We weren't there in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm born and raised, you know, um, and uh, the first time in my life that I've ever felt slightly uncomfortable living in this beautiful country was just in the past several months. First time in my life. Um, and so you coming out here today and the amazingness that we've seen in the past several months of the beauty of what it means to be American really touches me. And for all of you here today, you just contributed to that. So thank you again. I'd also like to thank MCC and Wanir specifically for his amazing professionalism and, and organization. And I'd also like to thank our our, our respected professor and teacher, Dr. Ali Atai, who's here humbly sitting, and I feel inadequate. He's my teacher, and I'm sitting here right now, but he's probably going to evaluate me and give me like a semi. <laughs> so uh, have some mercy. <laughs> so just to introduce, because this is called, you know, Meet Your Muslim American Neighbor. So uh, I'm a lawyer by profession. I practiced, I've been practicing law for about 12 years. And uh, I was at Dell Corporation. I was corporate counsel uh, for one from about 170 attorneys there. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of attorneys. Uh, too many in one place sometimes. And, uh, and then uh, I was blessed to, uh, to continue working as a lawyer, but then attended the first ever accredited liberal arts Muslim college in the Western Hemisphere, which is located in Berkeley, California. Yes, we're pretty lucky. It's called Zaytuna College. And while attending full-time, I continue to practice law, and now I work both as a chaplain, teacher, and as well as practicing law. I'm right now general counsel for a global laboratory, uh, which specializes in cancer. Um, so so that's, what, that's what we do. Uh, so this is, you know, meet your American Muslim neighbor. You know, if, if you see me out there, you might not know I'm Muslim necessarily. Uh, but uh, just like all of us, we're part. We share that family. So um, that's just the personal touch. You know, uh, a couple days ago, <laughs> a couple days ago, uh, my my daughter. I have three daughters. They might be running around here somewhere. Um, and uh, they went to our neighbor. You know, it's about neighbors, and, uh, and they say we need to put we need to put the hood back into the neighbor, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, or the neighbor back into the hood. <laughs> we need to put the neighbor back into the hood. And so the neighborliness, and so anyways, I was, uh, uh, my, my neighbors had a lemon tree, and my daughters went there, and they, they took a couple lemons, and, <laughs> and they started making lemonade. It didn't taste good, but she made $2.50. <laughs> I don't know how people just bought it out of mercy, but anyways, so uh, so she told me, yeah, our neighbor said that maybe we should ask before we take the lemons, uh, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, so you know, we went and bought some chocolate, and she wrote a letter, and she took took it to our neighbor, and and we're putting the neighbor back into the hood. And so she went and she knocked on the door and took some chocolate and took a nice letter, and and gave gave her the chocolate and the letter, and so. I think, like Assemblywoman shared with us, this is really about understanding one another. And today I invite and challenge everyone to come with an open, objective mind. You know, you can come with a skeptical mind or an 
or an objective mind. And so I open you to channel that. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to start with uh, Sister Henna. And what she's going to do, kind of, is try to remove some of the, the feathers in front of our eyes that block us from seeing the mountain of Islam and Muslims. They say you can put a feather in front of your eye that you can't see a mountain. Right? So, Hina is our myth buster. <laughs> right? And so there are a lot of myths out there. Right? For whatever reason, and we can get into what those reasons are, how they've been constructed. But she is going to help us deconstruct some of those so we can then try to succeed with that challenge and come with a non-skeptical mind but with an objective mind. Right? So then when we go to the next session, Dr. Esad, then we can approach some of the, the crux and the, the core, what are the tenets and the faiths and the practices of Islam, we can then remove some of those obstacles so we can see a little more objectively. And then we have uh, our uh, esteemed colleagues, we have uh, Mike with us, who will talk a little bit about one of the, 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 the elephants not in the room, right? We'll talk about jihad and what Islam says about that. And then finally, our final uh, guest panelist, uh, Sister Sarah, will tell us about her personal journey and how her personal journey into Islam has made her a better American. Yes, they're not mutually exclusive. You can be a beautiful Muslim and a beautiful American at the same time. So, without further ado, Sister Hina, she is a, a, a speaker, a writer, and one of the leading managers or principal of the homeschool co-op in Lafayette, California. And uh, I'm sure you will enjoy her. And of course, we will have, and I invite you everyone to be raw and real and authentic. And let's take something, let's come here with meaning, you know? Let's come here with meaning and let's leave with meaning. So we will have a very open question and answer session for after the panelists and after our break. Without further ado, please welcome Sister Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, so I've been really blessed to be able to be involved in interfaith work for a few years now. And it's been a really illuminating experience and it's allowed me to get to know members of different faith communities or, or people who don't subscribe to any faith community but who want to learn more about one another. And I've been really grateful for the opportunity. And one of the things that I've been seeing when I've been kind of out there talking about being a Muslim is that pretty much the same crop of questions come up everywhere I go. And they can be divided into like maybe four or five basic questions that get asked again and again. So I thought that I would address some of them right off the bat today in case anybody here has some of those questions and try to help demystify some of the terms that are out there that we're hearing in the media or hearing on the lips of uh, political pundits. So the first one I wanted to talk about was the buzzword that everybody's hearing about is Sharia. And um, a few months ago I was speaking in a church and I had an elderly woman stand up in the audience and really, you know, very, very concerned, very upset. And she said that she was really upset to see that Sharia law was taking over America and that the U.S. courts and judges could no longer um, judge according to American law that they were going to be judging according to Sharia law. So I didn't even know where to start with that. You know? um, but just off the bat, I want to make it really clear that there's no such thing as a dumb question. I want everyone to feel free that they can ask anything that they've been wondering about or that they're confused about, they want clarifications on. And uh, my heart actually really went out to her because she, she, her voice was shaking. She was so stressed out by the idea that Sharia law, quote unquote, was coming to take over America. So I want to first de deconstruct, demystify the word Sharia and um, get into what it is, what it means to Muslims, how it's implemented. So if we look at the root of the word Sharia, it actually means a path to a body of water. And if you think about what does a body of water do, like in the middle of a desert, an oasis, it's literally where you go to save your life. It's the path to the body of water is a path to salvation. And the understanding is that Sharia also, for Muslims, 
is a path to salvation, both in this life and in the next life. And it is how we live our daily lives. It constitutes pretty much day-to-day -day life for Muslims. It's what we eat, what we don't eat, what we, how we dress, how we don't dress, um, our prayers five times a day, giving 2.5% of our uh, savings and charity every year. It's known as zakat or the poor tax. Um, going on the pilgrimage at least once in your life if you're able. So that is what Sharia constitutes, the day-to-day -day life of a Muslim. And it's important to understand that before thinking of it as a legal code, it's actually a moral code. And so for it, it, and Sharia is more concerned with sin than actually with crime. So for example, if I were to tell a lie or lie to my friend here, there isn't an earthly law that's going to punish me for telling her a lie. But According to Sharia, I understand that unless I repent and change my ways, God will hold me accountable for telling a lie. So that all falls under Sharia. So thinking of it as, so it's not law as in the Western sense, and it can be misleading when we call it a law. Um, but it does, uh, it does help us decide like how we're going to divide up our inheritance when we write our wills. It does... Um, tell us the rules of marriage, the rules of divorce, um, all of that falls under Sharia. So the Muslims live by the principle that everything is permissible unless God has forbidden it in a sacred text. So that's our understanding. And so taking that understanding and taking the Holy Quran, our holy book, and also taking the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what he said, what he did, what his advice was, what his instructions were. Um, the Muslim scholars have classified every single action that we can possibly do into one of five categories. I'm just going to quickly tell you what those five categories are. I'm not going to go into the details of them right now, just in the interest of time. However, during Q&A, if you are interested in knowing examples of these different categories, I'll be happy to share them with you. So the five categories according to Sharia, every single thing we do, we think about which category does this fall under. It's either obligatory, it's by God. So all in the eyes of God, it's obligatory, it's disliked, it's permissible, it's recommended, or it's outright forbidden. So every single thing that we do falls into one of those categories. So thinking about our actions and which category they might fall under in Sharia allows Muslims to live a God-conscious life, to be really mindful about day-to-day -day living. Now, the purpose of Sharia is twofold. It's basically to um, establish religious practice and to establish social harmony. And there's five basic rights of Sharia, human rights. And those five rights are the right to religion, meaning that you can't force somebody to convert and you can't force someone to disbelieve. The second is the right to life, meaning you can't kill anybody. The third is the right to family and lineage, meaning we have a right to know where we come from and uh, what our lineage is, which, is, which would explain why in Islam um, sex is confined to marriage. And then the fourth is the right to honor, meaning that we can't slander people, we can't tell lies about one another. The fifth is the right to reason, meaning we can't do anything that affects our intellect, which would explain why alcohol and other intoxicants are forbidden. And then the sixth is to, the right to property, why you can't steal, or pillage, or rob, or cheat. So those are the, I'm sorry, those are six, the six uh, things that Sharia comes to protect. Now when most people hear the word Sharia, they automatically assume that it's got to do with penal code punishment. They imagine the, they visualize the YouTube videos that we're seeing these days, unfortunately, of honor killings, and stonings, and hangings, and and uh, things that are completely contrary to the everyday Muslim's understanding of Sharia. There is um, an understanding of corporal and capital punishment in Sharia, just like there is even in the uh, United States law here. 
And, but as far as capital and corporal punishment is concerned, these form less than 1% of Sharia laws, probably less than 0.1%. There's actually only capital punishment for three cases. Those are premeditated murder, adultery of married people, and apostasy with treason. Those are the three that fall under Sharia. And Sharia is implemented on a governmental scale by a legitimate authority, a legitimate government. It's not vigilante justice. It's not what we're seeing today, which is just hordes of angry young men going around taking the law into their own hands. Just like we have capital punishment here in America, but you and I, John Q. Citizen, cannot go out into the streets and decide to take the law into our own hands. And um, and the question is, so why, why is there capital or corporal punishment? What we've been told by God is that there are certain things that he wants us to not do out of fear of him. And so that's why those rules are in place. But however, it's really interesting that if we look at where Sharia has actually been implemented over the largest number of people and the longest period of time, to see how it was actually implemented is really eye-opening. 1,200 rules, 1,200 years of Sharia rule in Egypt, there were only two documented cases of punishment for adultery. And even those, it said that they were technically illegal and they were politically motivated. And during the entire period of the Ottoman Empire, which was from 1299 to 1923, there was only one confirmed case of punishment. And the scholars actually protested that judgment and it was never repeated. So that's actually when there was a legitimate authority that could implement the capital punishments for, that fall under Sharia, that's how it was carried out. What's happening today, the everyday Muslim does not recognize it and is just as baffled by it as anyone else. And also it should be understood um, that capital and corporal punishment is really only meant to be there as a deterrent. It's not meant to be there really to be implemented. The evidentiary bar for implementing any of these punishments are so high that it's difficult to prove some of these cases. And um, it's meant more to keep society functioning at a level where um, where open disobedience to God isn't done out in the streets. And so that's what the, these laws are there meant to, are meant to legislate in, in the Muslim countries, amongst Muslim citizens. So that would be if we were looking at it from a governmental scale. But Sharia, actually, for Muslims in America, is really about our personal lives, how we live our daily lives. It's not about anything in the court system. Okay, so just moving on from Sharia, the, the second thing that I get asked a lot about is jihad. And um, the under, a lot of people think that jihad automatically has to do with military combat. But that's not how Muslims understand it. There's a famous uh, tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was, um, you know, he had different facets to his life, and one of them was that he was a military commander as well. And one time on the way back from um, a skirmish, he was with his companions, and they were coming back from the battlefield, and his, he turned to his companions and he said, we go now from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And his companions were confused because they thought putting your life on the line in the battlefield must be the greatest jihad possible. So they asked him, well, what's that? What's the greater jihad? And he told them it's actually the jihad against the ego, the struggle against the self. Jihad in Arabic, the root word of it, actually has nothing to do with war. It has to do with struggle. And so jihad can be, you know, trying to give up telling lies or trying to give up gossiping. Jihad can be trying to give up cigarette smoking. Jihad can be trying, you know, not wanting to reach for that third chocolate chip cookie because you know it's not good for you. That is what jihad is for Muslims. It's a struggle, a struggle against the self. There is a military aspect to it as well, and um, but that can only be done under very, very noble conditions. And Mike's going to be go going into that. It's more uh, defensive rather than offensive. Okay. Um, the third thing, I think last time a majority of our questions were about ISIS. 
And um, ISIS is, you know, what's really heartbreaking about ISIS is that as Muslims, we're often asked to explain their actions and to disavow ourselves from them, to say that we have nothing to do with ISIS, while at the same time we're grieving and mourning what, they, what they're doing, not only to other communities, but to Muslims. Muslims are the greatest victims of ISIS's crimes. And uh, when my son was in high school, he said that was the most frustrating part about having to talk about ISIS, because he felt like he had to constantly explain to people that he doesn't agree with ISIS while at the same time being so outraged and upset by what they were doing. And uh, my youngest son, when he was 11, he's now 13, he said to me, um, but Mama, ISIS, they can't be Muslims. They're not Muslims, right? He just wanted me to say they're not Muslims. And I said, I, I know that you don't recognize Islam in them. There's nothing about them that tells you there's somebody from your faith community. But they claim to be Muslims, and that's how they're advertising themselves at. And so you, so you have to understand why people are confused. And so this is something we're going to have to answer, and we're going to have to explain. And he said to me, but they've taken everything that's beautiful, and they've made it ugly. And I asked him, like, for example, what do you mean? And uh, this was around the time that the Paris attacks had happened. And the Paris attacks happened on a Friday. And he said, Friday's our holy day. Friday's our day of prayer. What Muslim would go out and kill anybody on a Friday? And the ISIS flag is the flag, they have a seal on the flag that was the, the ring that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to wear that said, there's no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. And so he said, that's such a beautiful image. It's the seal from his ring with which he used to, you know, stamp the correspondence, the letters that went out in his name. And he said, they've made that their flag and they go around killing people. He said, that was something beautiful. Now they've made it into something ugly. So, um, all I can tell you about ISIS is that, I, I'm not a big political commentator, but what I can say is that I personally, and I know all my community members here, don't know anybody who supports ISIS or understands them. They, they are the bane of our existence here in America right now. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a political commentator, so I can't explain where they came from. I under, I've been told they've come out of a power vacuum and that, you know, when there was no government in place and they're vigilantes, but... Um, we're just as confused by them as anyone else. Okay, the the other question I get asked about is the Shia-Sunni differences. The Shias and Sunnis make up the religion of Islam. And uh, everyone here on this panel is Sunni, but many of us have friends and acquaintances who are Shia. And again, I'm not a big historian, so I'm just going to really, really dumb it down to the basics of how I know it. So the understanding um, that I have of the Shia Sunni uh, differences is that it, it was a split that happened in the Muslim community soon after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away. <coughs> and it was really over who gets leadership of the Muslims. The Shia said that it should be somebody from his family, and they believed that Ali, uh, the Prophet's uh, uh, cousin and son-in-law, that he's his rightful spiritual successor, and he should have been the leader of the Muslims after the Prophet Muhammad passed away. The Sunnis believe that it's a meritocracy, and that the best person for the job is the one who should be the leader. And so, the but no matter what the difference is, there are nuanced differences in how we practice our religion between the Shias and the Sunnis, but whatever the differences are, we do understand, again, as everyday Muslims, that you don't persecute one another for what you believe. You don't, um, it's not a reason for military conflict. What we're seeing happening in different parts of the world has got to do more with the geopolitical realities on the ground. It's kind of like if my only understanding of Catholics and Protestants was what happened in Ireland in the 1980s. Catholics and Protestants are not fighting in America or killing each other here, but that was a reality that was happening in Ireland in the 80s. Same, same thing with Shias and Sunnis. 
And then the last one, the big one I get asked as a woman, is about the hijab, the headscarf. And so the Arabic word hijab actually doesn't mean headscarf. The Arabic word for headscarf is khimar. Hijab actually means a barrier. It's a barrier that like clearly delineates, you know, where my where my boundaries are. And hijab is more than just uh, a piece of cloth on the head. Hijab has got to do with, like, I, I always joke that, okay, fine, I put a hijab on my head, but how do I actually put one on my personality? And by that, I don't mean that I can't be out there talking and getting to know people, um, but what I mean is, like, how do I inculcate the inner aspect of modesty, which is to not brag, to not be a show-off, to not make every conversation be about me, me, me. You know, that, that also falls under hijab. It's modesty. And it's modesty in actions, it's modesty in thoughts, and it's also modesty in how we interact with one another. Um, people ask about men, and that do, and, and so the, for, for Muslim women, one thing I want to make clear is that Muslim women are not a monolith. You're, there are all types of Muslim women, women who do wear the hijab, women who don't wear the hijab, women who believe you should wear the hijab but don't want to wear it, so they don't. Women who don't believe hijab is required, so they'll never wear it. There's all sorts of opinions out there. And amongst the women who do wear hijab, you'll see different forms of how uh, Muslim women choose to wear the hijab. Some women will wear hijab and they'll wear makeup. Some women will uh, wear hijab and, and dress in light colors. Some will dress in bright colors. There's all different understandings of how um, women choose to wear the hijab. But the concept of hijab is that Women who choose to wear it, wear it, and they cover every part of their body except their face, their hands, and their feet. So anyone you see wearing a hijab is usually uh, dressed that way. And traditionally, in Muslim cultures, and even here in the Western culture, men and women pretty much covered the same amount when they went out in public. Men wore hats, women wore hats. Uh, men wore long, uh, women wore long gowns and tops, men wore blazers and suits or whatever. Everybody was dressed from, from head to toe. That's how it's also been in the traditionally Muslim cultures as well. Men would go out in turbans and long gowns. Women would go out wearing the hijab and long gowns. Um, it was interesting because my grandmother, I, I always think about her, she, she visited us in 1990. And... Uh, she was sitting on the sofa with us while we were watching the show Candid Camera. <laughs> and it was, that was back when Dom DeLuise was the host, and he had this you know, pretty young model type co-host co with him. My grandmother did, didn't understand a word of English, but she was just, and she, doesn't, she didn't wear the hijab. But this was just her observation. She was uh, watching the television set, and she said, it's interesting that the man, he's got a beret on, you know, a hat, and he's wearing a full three-piece suit, but the woman is like in a tiny mini skirt and her cleavage is all showing and she's sleeveless. Like it's interesting how much skin is showing on the woman, but the man is completely covered. And uh, I remember as a teenager thinking, oh, I, I never noticed that. I never noticed that. So traditionally in Muslim cultures, you would see that men and women would cover pretty much the same. However, for men, the requirement of what they have to cover in their body, on their bodies out in public is between navel and knee. So that part of their body is always covered so they won't wear speedos, or they're not supposed to, um, or short shorts, or anything uncovering the belly button, button. And these are just understood that this is what God has told us to do, and this is the only reason. If I didn't believe that it was something that was pleasing to God, I wouldn't be wearing the hijab. So it's uh, based on people's individual understandings of what will bring them closer to God. And it's a personal decision. Many people assume that if you're wearing the hijab, you must be wearing it because a man is requiring it or demanding it of you. And it always surprises people when I tell them that when I chose to put on the hijab at the age of 28, I actually did it in um, direct opposition to what my husband wanted. He wasn't comfortable with the hijab. He didn't want me to wear it. Uh, he said he was a private person, and he didn't want it to be necessarily advertised every time we stepped out that, you know, we're Muslim. But I told him at that time, you know, this is between me and God. It's, it's got to do with nobody else, and he respected that. So, 
That's, I, I think I went over time. I'm really sorry. But during Q&A, if there's anything else you want me to expand on, I'll be happy to. And any other questions? Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate it. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting that of the four panelists we have, we have kind of, you know, because I feel like it's something so beautiful, but we can't yet talk about the beauty of what it is because we're clouded with so many other things, you know? Like something that's so amazing and so beautiful but you can't get to the beauty because you have to start with all this other stuff that you need to talk about, you know? But that's okay. Does anyone know who the first country was to recognize the existence of the United States of America? Morocco. Anyone? Morocco, a Muslim country. Does anyone know who established the first university in, in the world that continues to exist today? A Muslim woman, Fatima al Fahriya, also in Morocco. Yes. Great. Okay, so this next part is one of my favorite parts. Dr. Esad Tersin, who is an ER physician and also an author of a great book called Being Muslim, a Practical Guide, uh, is with us today, and he's going to present the the core tenets of the faith and I will I'll invite you to to explore what he's saying and process it this way there were three men that were invited into a dark room and in this dark room was an elephant and they didn't know what an elephant was and so they go in and they're saying discover an elephant and so the first man goes in and he touches the leg of the elephant the second touches the tail and the third touches the trunk of the elephant. And then they come out and they ask him, what is an elephant? So the first man who touched the leg says, an elephant is a strong pillar. And the second man says, no, 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 no. An elephant is a whip. <laughs> and the third says, you guys are crazy. I touched the elephant with my own hands. An elephant is a hose. <laughs> And all three of them start to say, you guys are all crazy, you guys are all wrong. Now we know that all three of them are, they're all incorrect. <laughs> An elephant is not a whip. An elephant is a live animal, it's a beast, it breathes, it walks, it makes sounds, it communicates, it has a family, it does this. It's not a whip. A whip is not alive. It doesn't move. A pillar is not alive. So, unfortunately, there are many Muslims and non-Muslims in the world that only know one piece of the elephant, one piece of Islam, and thus, and thus they have an imbalance. And so when we get this balance and we restore this balance, then the beauty of Islam can come out. So Dr. Esad will share with you, hopefully, and without further ado, please welcome Dr. Esad. Stand, if that's okay with everyone. Can you guys hear me okay with the mic like this? Um, yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everybody for showing up. Our esteemed guests, all of you coming on this Saturday afternoon. Very appreciated. I know how valuable days off are. Right? Um, so, I'm going to briefly um, try to cover the core uh, tenets of Islam. To put it simply, uh, sometimes we try to uh, put a puzzle together, but we don't have what the box top is, so we don't have a bird's eye view of the thing. I'm going to try to talk about the box top today, all right? We're not going to get into details. We're going to try to get that bigger picture. So a brief overview. I want to start with some definitions. Actually, I think before that, yeah, we're going to start with some definitions. Um, Islam and Muslims, and on a side note, I have a friend of mine who wants to start the S campaign, right? <laughs> That's Muslims with an S, not a Z, and Islam, but it's commonly mispronounced. Um, Islam and Muslims. So what is Islam? Islam is a proper name of the religion itself. Uh, it's an Arabic word, Semitic roots, uh, and it means to surrender oneself over to willingly. Mm -hmm. So if you surrender yourself over willingly, that is to be in a state of surrender or submission. The root word in Arabic also means the word peace or to be whole, or wholesome, okay? 
The word Muslim is the title for somebody who's an adherent of the religion. So somebody who follows the religion is a Muslim. The religion is called Islam. And I know it's kind of confusing with Christian and Christian, you know, Christianity, it's a little easier. Judaism, Jews, a little easier. For Islam, uh, there, we're, it's, it's a Muslim. A Muslim is one who willingly surrenders their will over to God and thereby achieves inner peace and wholeness. Mm -hmm. Now, Muslims can be from any ethnicity, all walks of life. Here are a few more uh, famous uh, Muslims who, who can name the top left. You'll age yourself if you can. But who's Cat Stevens, right? And then on the right, his name is right there, Dr. Oz. And in the front, uh, an, an, a great American hero we recently lost, Muhammad Ali. Um, so as you can see, it's people of all ethnicities, all cultures, um, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world spanning all continents. So you're going to get a lot of variety. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about one more term, the word Allah. It is commonly misunderstood that Allah is a particular God that is different than the God that we're used to hearing about. So Allah is simply the Arabic name for God. So Christian Arabs in church will say Allah. Christian uh, uh, Arabic Jews will use the word Allah. This is a copy of the Bible in Arabic, and it says, for those who can read Arabic, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So there's the word Allah in an Arabic Bible. Uh, this is the one God of Abraham who sent Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jesus, Moses, and the Prophet Muhammad. So how does Islam view itself? Islam sees itself not as a new religion, but a continuation of the truth that God has been revealing all throughout time. It's a culmination of the previous religions sent by God. One of the useful things that Muslims will talk about is we talk about Islam with a capital I and Islam with a lowercase i. What does Islam mean again? Submission to God. To surrender oneself over to God. So by that meaning, would Muslims believe Moses to be in a state of Islam? Yes, he was surrendered over to God. Was Noah in a state of su su surrender to God? Yes, etc. So we hold that all of God's religion is Islam in the generic sense, the lowercase i, um, with the final capital I, the final religion of Islam, the final version brought by the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century. There's a famous narration from the Prophet Muhammad in which, and it's important to see how Islam views itself in the greater human story. The Prophet Muhammad says that the parable, you know, prophets love parables, right? <laughs> parables. The parable of my coming is like a large, beautiful building. And everybody's walking around marveling at how beautiful it is. And they'll say, what a beautiful building, except it's just missing that last brick. And he said, I am that last brick. So Islam isn't something that comes to replace something from before. It's a completion of the tradition before it. There's a Muslim tradition that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tells us that God sent over 124,000 prophets to humanity. We don't know them all, but we know that every people had a prophet. The Native Americans had their prophets. We may not know who they are, right? The Asiatic peoples had their prophets. In Europe, they had their prophets. The Nordic people had their prophets. Everybody had a prophet sent to them by God. So what does this do for the Muslim? What does that mean if we don't know who these prophets are? We can accept that there may be remnants of truth in other traditions, even if we cannot confirm with certainty that it's a prophetic tradition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Muslims will entertain the possibility that the Buddha may have been a prophet, for example. They won't say that he is. We don't have any scripture that specifies him being a prophet the same way we do, say, Isaac or Jacob. But we can entertain that possibility that truth, divine truth and guidance may still have some remnants in that tradition if its source was indeed divine. So Islam doesn't have uh, an exclusive truth claim, meaning that only Islam has truth and everything else is absolutely false, um, but that Islam is the final and, co and, and complete culmination of the message of God as it's been sent down. So this is what you're going to be tested on at the end. Right? <laughs> These three things. There are three dimensions to the religion. Faith, conduct, and character. Faith, conduct, and character. 
Okay, so we're going to start with conduct. These are what are commonly referred to as the pillars of practice. Who's heard of the five pillars of Islam? Who can name them? <laughs> no, I'm I'm, I'm, that's what we'll go through. So these are actions that we perform. Okay, the five pillars, keep in mind, are only one of the three dimensions. We have faith, conduct, and character. They're the pillars of conduct. So the first is to pronounce the two testimonies of faith. Right? And this is what entered, this is what officially makes someone a Muslim. You say, they say, I testify, there is nothing worthy of worship save God. And by that we mean the God of Abraham, the God who sent the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who sent Jesus and Moses and Noah, etc. And that Muhammad is the messenger of God, the final messenger, and you have to accept all of the other messengers along with him. So to say that is what enters you into the religion. Then once one is a Muslim, they have to pray five times a day based on the position of the sun, uh, whether you're at work, try to take a break at five different points of the day to realign oneself um, and center oneself with God. There's also the purifying charity. So of your excess wealth that goes unused throughout the year, right? not what you make, but your unused wealth, um, if you're above a poverty line, two and a half percent, gentler than, the, than Uncle Sam, right? Two and a half percent goes to charity. Then there's fasting the month of Ramadan. We've already alluded to that. That there is a month of fasting from, sun, from uh, the break of dawn until sunset. And lastly is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. Okay? Now we're going to go to the second, which is faith. So faith, conduct, and character. Faith are realities that we believe in. Conduct is actions that we do. These are realities that we affirm, truths that we affirm. The first is God. Right? That's contested to some. We believe that to be a reality that anybody uh, with, who, who can reason with an open mind will know to be the truth. And we believe that there are things that God has revealed about himself. We know what are called in Islam the 99 beautiful names of God. So if that's something you're interested in, to know the nature of God, that's something that, that, that I would research. Then we believe in angels, that God has created beings in another dimension from ours. And we believe in Holy Scripture, that God communicates with His creation through Scripture. The Torah, the Gospel, the Psalms of David, and the Quran, for example. That these are all revelations from God to humanity. And every Muslim has to affirm each of them. And the messengers, the prophets. Uh, and I've, list, I've named some of them that we affirm. Uh, with the person of Jesus, you may have noted, I listed him in the Muslim tradition as what? A prophet. So we hold him to be, uh, there's sort of, if you think about two extremes, uh, he was rejected as an imposter and not the Messiah by some people historically. Uh, and on the other end, and early on there was uh, uh, some debate, there, were, there, is, there are Unitarian Christians, but eventually he was deemed to be divine. Um, Muslims hold him to be created, and he, was, he is the Messiah, born of a virgin birth, will return at the end of time brought life to the dead, we affirm all of those miracles, but affirm them to be miracles given to God's prophet, so that he is uh, a special prophet of God who will return at the end of time. And then we believe in the day of judgment, that each of us, whether we believe it or not, will be resurrected in a life after this one to be held accountable for everything that we do, hoping for some mercy Amen. on that day. Uh, and then we believe in divine decree, that everything that happens Destiny is all in divine hands. So these are realities that we believe in. So that's faith, conduct, and the third one is character. character. So this has to do with how, what is the Muslim understanding of purifying the soul? We believe that the soul has some innate good qualities, right? Hopefully, if, if, if you're healthy, right? There are people who have seen war, abuse, etc., and, and, and they, through that trauma, they may not. But most of us, if we see someone hurt, we'll be really bothered by that. If we were to watch our torture video, that would really pain us, right? We see, you know, a picture of a cute baby, at least the ladies in the room will say, what? Aww, right? This is an innate goodness that each of us has. Our souls know and incline towards goodness and beauty. But at the same time, we have an aspect of our being that's called the ego. And this is the part of us that, if we're honest, inclines towards selfishness, a little bit of vengeance, anger, jealousy, right? Wanting more than someone else. Um, and so we are in a battle 
to let the better nature of ourselves reign over the lower nature. And so that goes through the process of purification. We are to purge the vices of the soul. We are to work on not getting angry so much, not being jealous when somebody else gets something good and we didn't, right? Not, you know, uh, thinking ill thoughts of someone else. Um, and then we are to inculcate and we are to cultivate those positive qualities of, of generosity and forgiveness and love, okay? So those are both inherent in us, but it takes work to get there. And we also have a belief in asceticism. Obviously, this is something that the prophet Jesus um, in our tradition really epitomizes, but it is between rejection and indulgence in the Muslim tradition that we neither uh, call for a monastic living, that's not to uh, disparage other monastic traditions, but in Islam, it is not that we retreat from the world onto a beautiful hilltop, although that's tempting sometimes, <laughs> but we are to be in the world without le letting the world be in us. Exactly. So it is to have, as, as uh, the Sufis would say, it is to have the world in your hand, but not in your heart. Okay? Um, and that is, that is our asceticism. Our asceticism. Uh, so that is faith, conduct, and character. And they correspond to three, the three core virtues of Islam. That is truth, right? So we have to believe the truth. If you think, um, if you believe that there is no continent called Australia, right? You're simply mistaken. So your beliefs can veer from the truth to have proper faith. We believe that if you don't believe in a creator of the universe, right, that you're mistaken and that there are rational proofs that can correlate with faith. This is a longer conversation, but our, in the Muslim tradition, faith cannot be irrational. It can be super rational, but it cannot be absurd. So truth. And then we believe in proper conduct, that we have to be good people, our goodness. We have to be honest and just in our dealings. We have to be good to one another. We cannot harm one another. And lastly, our character, and that's beauty. So the three central Muslim virtues are truth, goodness, and beauty. And they correspond, therefore, to submission of the mind, faith, the body, your conduct, and the soul, which is your character. So only when all three of these, to borrow from Mehdi's analogy, right, the, trunk, the hose, the pillar, and the whip, right? The only when all three of these are surrender, surrendered willingly over to God do you live in a state of complete submission to Him. And so this is the middle road. Uh, Islam sees itself as merging the great spiritual tradition um, of Judaism with the rich, higher road uh, and, and the spirituality of the Christian tradition. And that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a great merger of these two. So we have... Conduct, and Hina talked a lot about that, in terms of the, what role the law has, and then what role the spirit has. Um, and so these three dimensions come together, hopefully to give us a, a, a brief overview of the box top of the puzzle um, called Islam. Faith, conduct, and character. Thank you for listening, and hopefully we'll take questions. Made it look simple. <laughs> they say a true master can make anything look simple. A true master can make anything look easy. Okay, okay, good. Well, thank you, Dr. Eshad. So, our next panelist is someone who's beautiful outside and in. Mr. Mike Kim <laughs> was struck by his handsomeness. Sorry to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Mr. Mike Kim is, uh, is a real estate guru uh, with seven children, uh, wonderful family man, just an open heart. And he's going to speak about his uh, Naval Academy experience and uh, broaden that a little bit to expand on what Sister Hina spoke about, which is the, the jihad and the rules of engagement in Islam and re related concepts. Does anyone know how many Muslims are in the U.S. Armed Forces? 4,000. 4,000. Does anyone know what percentage the FBI states that Muslims perform in terrorism? What percent Muslims, according to the FBI? What percent? Less than 6%, according to our very own FBI. Statistically, according to a Duke study, 
more Muslims report terror, report suspicious terror activity than any other ethnic group or religious group. Muslims report more, and actually, in a kind of a funny story, when I was in Orange County, there was, this, there was this dude, he was just kind of funny, and he was in the mosque occasionally. <laughs> and so uh, one day we, we called the local chapter of uh, a Muslim organization, and we said, this guy, you know, he's, he's talking a little weird, you know, he's bringing up some concepts that, you know, we're not comfortable with, and he comes to the mosque frequently, and he's talking to the guys, the young guys, and this, and, you know, we're a little uncomfortable, and we told our, you know, our local leadership. So our local leadership called the FBI, and said, hey, we want to report the suspicious activity of this, of this guy. It turned out that guy was an undercover FBI agent. <laughs> like, oh yeah, he's our guy, don't worry about it. Yeah, so that, that's, that's great to know. And finally, <laughs> finally, statistically, the least, one of the least civilizations in the history of, of our recorded history of the world, Islam and Muslims have conducted the least amount of violence in the civilizational history. This is just history, historically speaking. Um, so uh, I leave you with this final statement as you process what Mike shares with you. And it's a way to just comprehend this and think about it for a moment. It says, terrorism is to jihad what Adultery is to marriage. Terrorism is to jihad. What adultery is to marriage. So marriage is beautiful, it's sanctioned, you know, it's, it's uh, with consent, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's peaceful, it's comfortable, you take care of each other, although one is engaging in intimate relations. Um, and likewise, that's the way we can process it. Without further ado, please welcome Mike Kim. Can uh, everybody just stand and maybe stretch a little bit? <laughs> the leg, or, yeah. get the yeah. Can everyone hear me okay? Back there? Well? Okay, great. So, I think the, the best way for me to explain to you, uh, based on just one concept, is to provide some background on why the subject was of importance to me, and it's, it's tied to how I discovered Islam itself. So a, a good place to start is during my college years at the Naval Academy uh, in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, it was there as a freshman that I had a research assignment. And the assignment was to summarize the biographies uh, of the, the most major and most eminent scientists, philosophers, and mathematicians in the Western civilization. So I began thumbing through the books, and I glanced at a passage that literally jarred me. And the passage described how most of the renowned philosophers, mathematicians, and scientists were believers in a unified deity, a universal, or a transcendental. These are all academic neutral terms for a god. And that trying to understand the created universe was one of, if not, the prime motivation of their respective life's work. Now, this was quite a statement that the most revered, widely studied, and respected minds of the Western civilization were all believers in a god. Mm -hmm. Further, that their life's work were inspired by the desire to know the created universe. For example, that Isaac Newton's law of motion, laws of motion, was in part an exploration into the origin of motion at the moment of creation. That René Descartes' Cartesian coordinates system was in part a study of geometric, geometric relationships of created mass. And the, list, and the examples go on. So I quickly deduced that, that if the vast majority of the most eminent thinkers and philosophers and scientists were all believers in a creator, it seemed logical to me that I would benefit from their knowledge. So this launched me on a quest. I continued to read, study, and debate, and search out answers to the growing number of questions and conflicts that I'd accumulated during my years at Annapolis and on the subject of religion. And in the end, I left Annapolis with two firm conclusions. One was that the observable balance, harmony, and order nature of the created universe strongly indicated that there was only one God, and two, that in a created universe, divine matters must necessarily take precedence over all human and earthly matters. 
Those are my only two conclusions. Armed with these two convictions, I began my journey trying to discover the right religious system of belief. But as a consequence of my academic inquiry, I established what I believed was a fairly high bar for a system of belief that I was willing to adopt. So for example, on a scientific level, I was in search of a religion where science could not disprove God, given a self-evident relationship between the creator and the created. A standard I held fast was one where scientific discoveries must support the existence of God, not disprove it, and two, that all scientific discoveries would lag behind and ultimately validate revelation. I found numerous examples in the Quran. For example, I was a navigator in the Navy. It was always a mystery to us how, or not a mystery so much anymore, but in the history of, 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 of nautical research, how certain bodies of water retain their principles without mixing. So, for example, and the Quran talks about this, how God puts a barrier between the waters, and it creates all manner of, of interesting things, like in the Atlantic Ocean, there's freshwater layers that go underneath the warm water layers for many hundreds of nautical miles, creating extreme weather disturbances. How certain salinity content don't mix, how temperature gradients remain you know, as such. It, it was a mystery for the longest time. Uh, another example is, is the Quran talks about how the mountains act as stabilizers. And it was, it was much later that we discovered that mountains act as, as a sta stabilizing force between the strata plates to hold it together. Um, how the universe was gas, then mass, then it imploded, and it's in constant motion, and it's ever-expanding. These are all the stuff that's talked about in the Quran by an illiterate, unlettered prophet uh, uh, living in the desert 1,400 years ago who's never seen the ocean, certainly nor the, or the high mountains, you certainly have a high power telescope to observe the cosmos 1400 years ago. So, let's do, do for examples, and there's many more of how it, it, there's, there's revelation that is ahead of scientific discovery, right? So that was evidence to me. Uh, on a social level, I held fast to the idea that the outward practice of religious ceremonies needed to reflect the core teachings of the religion to be true and relevant. Any incongruence or conflict between his teachings and ceremonial practice was to me an indicator of corruption or distortion. A good example of this is of this consistency in Islam is a five is a Friday prayer where everyone of all backgrounds prays in a straight line, rich, poor, black, white, brown, shoulder to shoulder, facing one of the earliest places of worship built by Prophet Abraham and his son Ismail, known today as Mecca. To me, the weekly prayer ceremonially, symbolically, and in practice reflect the teaching of brotherhood, equality, and peaceful coexistence. On a philosophical level, take the concept of equality. The very notion of equality, absent a creator, was illogical to me because no two human beings are equal, whether intellect, strength, wealth, height, or any other standard of measurement. We are rendered equal, logically, only when the Creator of all declares itself from the perspective of the Creator. In fact, Thomas Jefferson recognized this conflict when he explicitly stated in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. On a spiritual level, ponder the concept of afterlife, heaven and hell. Absent an afterlife, our lives are inconsequential in the big picture sense. We can only truly live a consequential life if we are held to the account for the deeds here we do on earth. So it gave real meaning to the religious teachings of be good to your neighbor, be responsible stewards of nature, care for the old orphan and the elderly, feed the hungry, since these acts would have eternal consequences. It was clear to me that belief in divine judgment of our deeds here on earth was an effective way of encouraging humanity, humanity to live a more virtuous and noble life. So these are just a few of the issues that I grappled with and which Islam addressed to my satisfaction. Finally, in terms of armed conflict, as a student of the, at the U.S. Naval Academy, we all spent a good amount of time studying and understanding modern laws of war based on just war theories. And for the United States, they are derived from three primary sources, lawmaking and treaties or conventions, such as the Hague Convention of the late 1800s to early 1900s, the Geneva Conventions following World War II, 
Number two is globally accepted uh, practices and customs. For example, the laws of the sea traditions, which the nation states have all adopted as, as how we're going to conduct ourselves on the high seas. And the third are fundamental and universally accepted principles, such as military force for defensive purposes only. Uh, principle of distinction, dis distinguishing civilian from military uh, combatants. Uh, law of proportionality, uh, if, if one attack, we should deliver one attack, not multiple attacks. Uh, targets of military necessity, avoiding tracking infrastructure, schools, etc. It is important to know that these universally accepted principles have been abrogated in recent years. As we all know, we, we now have a policy of preemptive strike as opposed to defense. We have a, a, a risk of widespread collateral damage, so the principle of distinction seems to be put on the shelf. Um, there's frequently targeting of schools and hospitals and infrastructure. So the point is that, um, that the source of these principles derives itself from the collective wisdom of man. Thus, it is not ultimately durable as opposed to divine principle, which by its very nature is ultimately durable, for it has no higher authority on earth. There is no Congress, president, king, or dictator who can change it, right? So that's one of the things that I recognize about, that not, it really intrigued me what some had to say about warfare, because it, it, no matter what ISIS does or doesn't do, they cannot change the divine guidance mm -hmm. through, the, through the arc of time, ever, right? So what are those things? So Islam also has its rules and laws governing armed conflict. Among major categories, it covers international law, ethics, military jurisprudence, treatment of diplomats, hostages, refugees, prisoner of war, rights of asylum, conduct in the battlefield, treatment of women, and the list goes on. Um, I found that the Islamic corpus of, of teachings on matters of armed conflict, comprehensive, thorough, and humane, more so than the modern just war theories that I just recited to you earlier. It's worth noting that these sophisticated and well-developed concepts were proclaimed and implemented in the pre-modern world. We forget that the world 1,400 years ago was very tribal, essentially lawless, and weak to no institution. In the pre-modern era, before there, were, before there were borders, people were always attacking and invading other people on lands. It was very fluid. So, to, to, so to, uh, in that environment, to have the very sophisticated, comprehensive laws and principles was very impressive even more so comprehensive and humane than the ones we have today. Um, so I just want to touch upon a real brief example, and, and I'll stop talking. Uh, the Quran states that permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wronged. Those who have been driven out of their homes unjustly only because they said, our Lord is God. And if God did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temples and churches and synagogues and mosques. So what is that saying? Breaking it down. The, the permission, but not a commandment, to fight is defensive. And that's one aspect. And that, fighting, and that fighting is to be used to protect temples, churches, synagogues, and mosques. Which is to say that we, have, we believe in the universal religious freedom. Right? Um, another quick example is, uh, before the Prophet Muhammad... Uh, uh, allowed his, his soldiers to go into battle, he gave 10 uh, concrete rules that they could not violate. They were, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick, number one. Number two, do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Number three, do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Four, do not harm any livestock except for food. Five, in combat, avoid striking the face. For God created all of us in the image of our father, Adam. Number six, Adam the prophet. Number six, do not kill the monks in monasteries and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Seven, do not destroy the villages and towns. Do not spoil the cultivated fields and gardens, meaning you can't starve people. That's not a tactic of war that's allowed. Number eight, do not wish for encounter with the enemy. Pray to God to grant you security, but when you are forced to encounter them, exercise pacing. And directly, this, this commandment is, you can, you're allowed to fight somebody that's fighting you only. That's it, no one else. Even if in the military, you've got logistic people, military doctors, you can't harm them. It's just that individual who's actively fighting you is the only one you're allowed to fight. Number nine, no one may punish with fire except 
the lord of the world. So in the modern era, weapons of mass destruction, chemical uh, weapons, <laughs> nuclear, napalm, atomic, all of those will be forbidden in Islam. And number 10, accustom yourself to do good if people do good, and do not do wrong even if they commit wrongs. Be, mean, show mercy and be kind to people, even in, in combat. This is important because warfare is the most brutal activity that a human being can engage in. And if you don't conduct yourself with ethics and values and principles, you'll walk away from the battlefield damaged. No different than an animal. When a lion destroys a deer, we don't impose morality on the lion, do we? Lion just does what the lion does, right? But as human beings, when we engage in destruction, we have to do so with certain principles and values. Otherwise, we become nothing less than a lion. We walk away from the battlefield no better than animals. So in order to preserve humanity from engaging in the most <laughs> brutal acts, we have, we have to adhere to these uh, moral sets of, and guidances, otherwise we lose our humanity on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I invite everyone to take a look at this handout. Uh, it's for your benefit. We try to summarize the panelists' key core items here in this for your benefit, as well as a take takeaway with you. Also, if you have before our final panelist Sarah uh, engages us <coughs> with her story, if anyone has questions, you receive the index cards. Please uh, write those down, because uh, after our final panelist and before the Q and A session, we're going to have a small five minute break to grab some coffee or to grab some tea or something like that, and your cards will be collected. So you can get those ready in the meantime. Um, so Sarah is going to share her story with us as an American and as a Muslim. And, uh, you know, Mike was talking about the, the U.S. Constitution. And honestly, you know, God bless this country. I mean, it, the U.S. Constitution is arguably, probably the most amazing man-made human document in human history. I mean, to see it in action, the checks and balances, the separation of powers, and to see it and what it's done, it's one of the most amazing man-made human documents in human history. You know, and I'm proud of that as an American. You know what I mean? I'm proud of that. And so we return to that, and this is, this is our return to those, those core tenets and core beliefs. And finally, as Sarah shares her story, as an American and as a Muslim, I just want to tell you guys about my American hat. This is my American hat. And if I take it off, it would be un-American. Because in America, it's a place where we're comfortable with who we are, we're comfortable to be a little different, and we welcome those differences. And if I'm embarrassed to take off my American hat, that would be un-American. Sarah is one of my personal role models. She's an amazing human being. Uh, her productivity and her exemplary character uh, is just impeccable. May God bless her. Everyone say amen or amen. Uh, she is also one of the, the founders and spearheaders for the homeschool co-op in Lafayette, California. And without further ado, please welcome Sarah. So first of all, I know Matthew and uh, Munir and Bordy, thank you all for coming, but I feel it's really important to do that as well, because we can assemble a speaker, a panel of speakers all we want in an attempt to share the truths about who we are, but this would have no impact whatsoever if people like yourselves weren't showing up to hear us. So I'm honestly both honored and humbled to be sitting here before you on a Saturday afternoon um, when everyone probably has a lot of other things they could be doing right now. So I really, really appreciate that. And I'd like to believe that we're all here today because we love our community and our country and our world and that we know that when we seek to understand and respect one another, we can then elevate ourselves and our, our respective communities and our beloved country to the highest levels. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> So the title of my talk is, How Islam Made Me a Better American. But what does that really mean, to be an American? There are likely many definitions for this. 
However, I am confident that there are a set of ideals which resonate with most Americans. <coughs> Compassion, integrity, mutual respect, kindness, generosity, equality. These are all qualities which I think good human beings, good Americans, strive to embody. What I would like to speak about today is a topic that I can address with what I hope is a sincere and passionate heart, and that is the topic of racism. Growing up, I was very close to my maternal, my paternal grandparents. I would spend summers in North Carolina with them, and since I was an early riser like my grandfather, we would enjoy a daily 7 a.m. breakfast at a rest restaurant nestled at the bottom of the mountain where he lived. I was proclaimed his favorite granddaughter, partially because I was named after his eldest daughter, Sarah Jo, who passed away in a tragic car accident just a year before I was born. Apparently, I looked like her as well, so his affinity towards me was clear and understandable to all, and in return, I deeply adored him. He was a generous man who showered love and affection on all of his grandchildren, but the one thing I remember not knowing how to love about him was his deep-seated racism and hatred for people of color. He openly insulted and disrespected black people, he frequently used the N-word. I remember being really, really uncomfortable with his attitude and actions towards blacks. So naturally, I exonerated myself from being racist. In hindsight, however, I realized that the post-civil rights era in the South was still rife with unspoken racism. Though there were African Americans in town and in school, we had very little to do with one another. I didn't have any black friends. I didn't live near black people. I didn't sit near black people in class or at lunch. Basically, there was minimal to no interaction between them and us. Separate but equal may have been banished by law, but it was alive and well in everyday actions, even in mine. But in my mind, however, I was all American as apple pie, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed high school cheerleader. My European ancestors landed on American shores in the early days of settlement, my mother is part Native American. I think I'm 1 16th Native American. I lived in southern suburbia and was the daughter of a self-made businessman, attending some of the best public schools in the area along with church on Sundays, with my mind set squarely on attending a service academy after graduation. So who was more American than me? In 1996, I had completed a couple of years at the U.S. Naval Academy before deciding military life was not for me, I transferred to the University of Maryland to get my degree in civil engineering, married my husband Mike, and had our first son, Ben. Mike was still in the Navy and stationed in Japan, and I stayed in the States to finish my degree. And it was at that time that I was introduced to Islam. My talk is not about my conversion story, so I won't much, go into much detail about that. But I do want to share with you how being Muslim completely altered my understanding of race. Before I do that, however, I think this is an appropriate time to share a few of the Islamic teachings regarding race, which come to us via the sayings of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or via the verses taken from our holy book, the Quran, which we do believe to be the direct word of God, whom we call Allah in Arabic, as Dr. Asad already explained. And as I share these with you, um, and Mike has already reminded everyone of this part of the Declaration of Independence, uh, keep in mind the, the, the opening line of the preamble uh, that says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And in Islam, we are taught that righteousness is the only quality that makes someone virtuous in the sight of Allah. Not race, or skin color, or lineage, or country. In his last and final public sermon to the Muslims over 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, very clearly addressed this topic of racism when he said, O oh people, your Lord is one and your father Adam is one. There is no favoritism of an Arab over a foreigner, nor a foreigner over an Arab, neither red skin over black skin or black skin over white skin, except only through righteousness. We were also taught by the Prophet Muhammad that God created Adam from handfuls of clay and dirt collected from the different areas of the earth. So just as the dirt of the earth is different colors, we have black soil, white sands, and red clay, the children of Adam come in different colors as well. Finally, he taught us that there is no good in red skin or black skin, 
but that our value lies only in the righteousness and in our closeness to God. So these are just some of the teachings of Islam that slowly began to permeate my life and to help me develop a deeper understanding of the problems with racism. However, there was one crucial time in my life that these teachings really took hold of me and taught me the true essence of what it means to be an American. My father, at the age of 50, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor and given two months to live. I wanted to take my young son back, then back home with me to South Carolina so that I could take care of my father in his final days. He readily agreed to have me come, but firmly warned me against trying to convert him to my new religion. I had become Muslim only three months prior. I assured him I would do no such thing, and I headed to South Carolina. Interestingly enough, in a very short period of time, after quietly observing me in my worship and noting my newfound mindfulness that I brought to my day-to-day -day life, my father began questioning me about my faith. Facing death, he was forced to think about his mortality, so he started seeking answers to the questions of what might be coming after death and what had been the real purpose of his life. I tried to answer his questions to the best of my ability, but my own limited knowledge of my new religion couldn't satiate his deep curiosity. He peppered me with questions, and I literally ran out of answers. In desperation to provide him with what he was looking for, I searched for a local Muslim community where I might be able to take him so that he could speak to someone, anyone, who could give him the answers that I simply could not provide. I searched in the phone book, I asked around, nothing. I could find no Muslims anywhere close to us. I was desperate. For days and nights, I prayed to God. And though I didn't know everything about Islam, I did know that one of the irrefutable tenets of the religion is that one condition of prayer is that you have to recognize and submit to the knowledge that only God has the power to answer your prayer. And answer it, he did. One morning, my father stumbled across an ad in a local paper announcing the grand opening of an Islamic center in the next town. He eagerly showed it to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was truly a miracle. God had sent us some Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> that very next Saturday, we drove to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to meet these Muslims in the hopes that they could help my father settle the affairs of his soul. And to my surprise, and honestly, to my disappointment, we saw that the entire group was comprised of African Americans. Not one other white person was in the room. My heart sank, certain that this was a mistake. Deep down, I knew that there was just no way my father could be guided to a new belief system through a group of African Americans. It just wasn't possible. He had been conditioned all his life by his father to spurn them. But another fact we are taught in Islam, Allahu Akbar, which means God is greater. God, are, God is greater than anything we can imagine, and is certainly greater than all the limitations we place upon ourselves and the limitations we place upon others. So when my father emerged from the center, he was a man deeply moved by all those whom he had met. He was a man who received answers to the questions that had remained unanswered for so long, and he was now a man of the Muslim faith. Through the words and the actions and the sincerity of those whom he had been groomed to hate, he had found acceptance, love, and a faith that he would embrace and practice as a means of drawing closer to his creator until his death almost one year later. May God have mercy on him. This is something Muslims say about those who have passed, similar to when we, people say, God rest his soul, or may he rest in peace. The black Muslim community in South Carolina took very good care of my dad and me. They would invite us into their homes every Friday after congregational, congregational prayers, my father would be with the men, and I would hang out with all of the women and children. The men became an unwavering web of support for my father, teaching him, guiding him, and helping him come to terms with his impending death. While I was comforted by and thrilled with the peace that my father had found, this was actually a momentous turning point for me as well. For the first time in my life, I had black friends. They were more than friends to me, however. They were my sisters. We would pray together, <coughs> sing together, eat together, and laugh together. It was a beautiful and memorable time in my life. It was a Friday in February, nearly one year after my dad's conversion to Islam, when he returned to his Lord. 
At the time of his passing, my two-year-old son, Ben, an African-American brother named Abdullah and I were all sitting at his bedside. By the way, Muslim women often refer to Muslim men as brothers, and the men often refer to women as sisters out of respect. Anyway, this brother had come to visit my father so he could read from the Holy Quran in his presence. Muslims believe that the recitation of the Quranic words in Arabic brings solace to the heart, and the specific reading of a chapter named Yasin helps ease the soul's passing from this world to the next. And it was through the lips of this black man that these verses aided my father's soul. And it was the brothers from this community who came to pick up his body. It was they who washed his head and his limbs, who perfumed him, who shrouded him, and prepared his body for burial. They arranged for the funeral, transported his coffin to the cemetery, lowered his body into the ground, and then prayed over him in accordance with the Islamic rituals of burial. There were rows and rows of black men praying for my father's soul. If only my grandfather had been there to witness that tremendous and powerfully ironic scene. So that was the starting point from which all of my unrealized racism began to melt away. It was at that point that I became truly Muslim and truly American. I understood unequivocally the power of humanity without preconceived notions or discriminatory underpinnings. And upon moving to California, I have continued to be blessed with the most amazing and fr friends and community members from all backgrounds, races, and religions. It is on this premise of mutual respect for all of God's creation that I have found a true kinship with all races and all people. Because of our faith, my life and my husband's life and my children's <coughs> lives have been elevated, and I hope and pray that we all will always be positive contributors to the greater society in which we live. I can surely say with immense gratitude and humility that I am a better human being and a better American for it. And it is my sincerest wish that my children, along with all the children of our Muslim communities, will lead future generations of Americans based on the premise of God's command to get to know one another in peace and respect and to create a life that uplifts all that is good and suppresses all that is evil. Thank you for Generations is your family been in America? Do you know? Not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there are some opinions that uh, uh, academic opinions and records that indicate that Muslims came over with Christopher Columbus on the same boat, uh, and there are records that indicate, such as the like of Bampit Muhammad, fought in the Revolutionary War a few hundred years ago. Uh, and there are many other records that indicate Muslims have been in this great land for, for centuries. Um, so we're going to take a small break uh, to get some coffee, some tea, and stretch a bit. And by the way, if you hear a little girl's giggling, I dropped my wife off at the airport yesterday. <laughs> um, and if their hair is a little messy, don't pretend to think I have to do their hair this morning. <laughs> Please enjoy your break. Okay, so uh, I have three question cards here, but, but they essentially ask the same question, which is um, how can non-Muslim community members best support and help our Muslim neighbors and friends? And so first and foremost, I, I have to say I'm, we're really touched by uh, you know that question because it, it really expresses your genuine concern for our uh, well-being and, uh, and 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 I'll tell you. As one time, I was not a Muslim, obviously, because you heard my conversion story, and 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 so I have total empathy for the average American who harbors a lot of distrust or or even hate towards you know, the Muslim world because of of the the media and how it's presented. I myself felt I had a visceral reaction to the idea of becoming a Muslim when I started entertaining the idea. I was like, heck, no, I'm not that. No way. So it took a long time before I, you know, anyway, so I have a lot of empathy for, um, and, and contrast that to all of you, I mean, you're here, you know, despite all of that, you're here with an open heart and open mind, and spending your precious weekend time with us to learn about Islam, which is, so I'm really touched and very impressed by that. 
So with the question of how can you help or what can you do, I'm reminded about a guidance in our religion where we're told that, that if and when you see a wrong, stop it physically, if, even if it's physical, you have to stop it. If you can't do that, speak out. If you can't do that, know in your heart that, that is the wrong thing. And that is the least of faith that we're taught. So I would uh, perhaps uh, in humbly give you the same guidance if you see something wrong, a conversation turning weird, or you know, somebody saying, uh, you know, not, not just about Muslims, but racist stuff. And, you know, I, we all know, right, that we just can't tolerate hate and division in our, in our community. You know, let's not be a salad bowl, let's be a melting pot, let's really embrace, let's not tolerate, you know, let's embrace, not tolerate, right? So let's change our mind shift and, and speak out what we can um, for the true value of this country, which is one of justice and equality, and, you know, and, and we value multiculturalism, because there's strength in it, and it's shown that time and time again. So that's what I would ask you to do. Thank you. On a more personal note, I just um, really am touched by people who more recently had a lot of smiles, a lot of uh, greetings, um, you know, when I'm out in public. It's, it's really, that to me makes a huge difference. I know maybe globally or nationally it's not making a big difference, but it makes a big difference to me. So if you see a Muslim, you know, say hi, you know, <laughs> open the door for them or something, can I help you? Or that, things like that really, really do go a long way. Um, the question I have is, do Muslim families raise boys differently from girls. I have uh, six sons and one daughter. Um, I think we generally, first of all, this question, it depends on the culture that you're a part of, obviously. Um, so if a Muslim family here in America is recent, you know, has moved to America recently, they might have a lot of their own culture um, informing how they raise their children. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is how we raise our kids and how people that I know and I'm you know, intimately familiar with raise their kids, but generally it's the same. Um, my daughter has the, they all have equal access to education, they've all learned how to drive, um, we have a kitchen cleaning chore chart, they're all on the kitchen cleaning chore chart. Um, in that sense, there's, there's no difference. Uh, we do, as Muslims, recognize that a woman is different than a man in many ways, and we don't uh, teach that we're exactly equal. We're equal in the sight of God, but we're not equal in uh, the way that we were made. You know, women have different tendencies than men. So we honor that and um, and just encourage healthy families and encourage our daughter to do things that um, are in her nature and encourage our son to do things that are in their nature. They've all played sports. Um, yeah, they've all helped, uh, you know, at Santa Ranch, um, which is where we have our homeschooling co-op. In different ways, my daughter did a lot more with the horses because that was she was what was she was interested in. My sons, <laughs> oh, they helped with the facility team. Yeah, they helped more with like, but that's what they were interested in. My my uh, one of my sons now does, but anyhow, the point is, it's it's not. Um, there's not a lot of difference other than the fact that a man is a man and a woman is a woman, and there are any there are differences as far as we've been taught in the Bible. All right, so I got one of these questions. I was hoping somebody would ask. Um, so remember when I talked about how every single action is classified in one of five categories? So somebody asked, okay, so if I see a baseball game on television, what category of action does that fall under? <laughs> so I'm going to go through the different categories and give examples. So first, uh, there's the category of obligatory. And the understanding is that you have to do it. And God has told you that you have to do it. And he's told us, either in the Holy Quran or through the Prophet Muhammad, that we will be rewarded by God for doing it and we'll be punished by God for not doing it. So some, an example would be uh, our five daily prayers or being respectful to our parents. Um, the second category is disliked. That's something that you uh, would be rewarded by God for not doing it, but you will not be punished by God for not doing it, for, for doing it. So for example, swearing, um, that's one that's changed over time, yeah. Um, divorce, uh, wasting water while washing for the prayer, 
eating garlic before going to the mosque to pray. <laughs> so that comes under the category of disliked. Um, the third category is permissible. Not rewarded for God by God for doing it. You're not rewarded by him for not doing it. You're not punished by God for doing it. You're not punished by God for not doing it. For example, like eating or sleeping. The exception to this is unless you're doing that action for the love of good. So an example would be coming on a Saturday afternoon to an interfaith event to learn about your fellow Muslims. If you come, not necessarily you're going to be rewarded for it. If you don't come, you're not going to be punished for it. Either way. However, if you're coming for a greater purpose, for good, that you want to you know, have peace amongst people, you want to understand about others, you want to help make the world a better place, then that action of coming to an event like this becomes something that you actually do get rewarded for. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's all about intention. The fourth is an action that's recommended. You're rewarded by God for doing it, but you're not punished by God for not doing it. So for example, if I'm if I'm in a rush and I'm going down the road and I see an old lady, she needs help carrying her luggage. If I stop to help her with her luggage or her packages, I get rewarded by God for doing it. However, if I have a flight to catch and I'm in a rush and I just can't, there's no punishment for not helping her lady who needed help. And um, another example would be saying, saying, As-salamu alaykum, may peace be upon you. You're rewarded for saying it, but there's no repercussions for not. Okay, and the last category is forbidden. So that's something that God has told us that there's a punishment for doing it, and there's a reward for not doing it. So the examples would be things like murder and robbery and sex outside of marriage. So those are examples. So watching baseball. <laughs> what do you think it falls under? Permissible. Obligatory, disliked, permissible, recommended, or forbidden? Permissible. permissible. <laughs> I try to teach my kids this to turn every mundane action into a rewardable action. Um, so it's all in your intention. So if you're watching baseball with the intention of spending time with your family and increasing the love amongst you, or making your husband happy because he loves baseball, and you know, <laughs> then all of a sudden that permissible action becomes an action uh, that's rewarded. So um, it's all in your intention. <laughs> um, I want to add something. Just stay with me for a minute. Okay? Uh, when I first came across in this, um, this, these stressed intentions, intentions, so I was like, "What is it with this intention business? Right? Just do it or don't do it." But um, what I later discovered is the importance and significance of intentions, and it's a, one of those another one of the scientific uh, aha moments, which is. Um, now, science is really getting a better understanding of uh, what happens at the subatomic level, right? At the atomic level, meaning electrons, neutrons, protons. And that's where the, the foundation of our physical science is derived from, the observable universe, right? F equals MA, E equals MC squared, all the stuff that we study to know about. But what we are discovering is that the behavior of matter at the subatomic level is entirely different than at the observable atomic level. So much so that depending on who is present, the activities at the subatomic level is different than if I was present or who. Meaning that our intentions have tremendous meaning all of a sudden. That the universe conspires to make your intentions a reality at the subatomic level. And that also further uh, gave me, I think, a better understanding of, of what God meant when he said that God made us caretakers of the world. And I thought to myself, how am I a caretaker of the world if, if you know, the, 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 the physical universe just does what it does, right? But with this understanding of, of, of intentions and how the universe moves to help us achieve our goals and make our intentions a reality, give meaning to the idea that, that we are truly caretakers of the world. It, it responds to us, you know, like, a, like a, an animal would or even a tree, even water, you know? And so it just gave a whole new, deeper understanding from a scientific perspective of, the stuff that is some used to stress that I, that I used to bother me, but bothers me less now. <laughs> so we have about uh, 13, 14 questions left, and we want to finish at 3.30. So it's about 24 minutes. So we have about two minutes per question. So if you see us rushing a little bit, if you see us rushing a little bit, it's just to honor everyone's time in the room. So just a heads up.
And, and if you don't get your question answered, I'm sure some of us yeah. will be happy to hang around afterwards. And some of these require more conversations than sort of multiple choice answers, but mm -hmm. we'll try. I've got a few, some are short answers. One is a long answer, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm warning you guys. Um, let's go with the short one. Just curious, how was the number 124,000 determined regarding the number of prophets? Such an odd number to me. Uh, that comes through a report of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was told that God sent a messenger, a prophet, to every people on earth. Um, and each one was sent to uh, his or her people. Uh, and there's a difference of opinion, even like Mary, the Lady Mary, by some uh, Muslim scholars, is thought to maybe be a prophet, um, because she had the Archangel Gabriel um, interact with her. Uh, and so each one was sent to their people, but there is only one prophet that we believe had a universal message, which is the prophet of God to be upon him. Um, uh, whereas, you know, Jesus and Moses were sent to uh, uh, the tribes of Israel, etc. Um, so yeah, that number comes through um, uh, a, a revealed report. Um, can you recommend an acceptable uh, interpretation of the Holy Quran in English? There's a couple of, so I would answer this on two levels. If you're looking for a good, easy translation to read, um, is it on this sheet? Right. Yeah. So, okay, so if you're looking for like an abbreviated version, there is the third one down, it's called the Essential Quran, with a K, um, translated by Thomas Cleary. And that is sort of like a selection of some, some of the main chapters and passages and sort of like, the highlight reel, for lack of a better term. Um, then on the middle level, there's um, a translation by, the last name is Halim, H-A-L-E-E-M. It's the Oxford Classics translation. Um, that, to me, is probably my personal favorite translation to read. Very readable, um, very accurate translation, with some footnotes, right? Doesn't Not overbearing in terms of the footnotes. If you uh, are really scholarly and you have a lot of time on your hands and you really want to sort of get nitty-gritty, there's that one that called the Study uh, Quran, a new translation and commentary, um, and there's a link for it there. So that's sort of the three levels of, of depth, depending on um, your level of interest. Um, what is the relationship between Muslims, Hindus, Muslims, and Jews, political origin? Um, that's a broad question. I'm not sure what exactly is being asked. Uh, that's literally what's written there. I can ask. I can ask. Yeah. Can you add to what? Yeah. You? Yeah. It was hearing earlier, I was hearing references to Christianity and, yes. and the overlaps, yeah. and I wasn't hearing about um, Hinduism as being recognized in that same manner Correct. in yeah. terms of prophets, and, and I just wanted some clarity about, because there is so much strife, especially in India, Pakistan, that area, Yes. how, how do Muslims yeah. hold Hindus more? Great, 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 great question. Hindu. Yeah. No, great question. Um, there are 25 prophets that are named in the Qur'an that we all affirm. Um, the, I would say, to make up a number off the top of my head, probably 85% to 95% to, to 90 are biblical prophets. It's names that most of us from the Abrahamic traditions would be familiar with. There's a handful of, of, of prophets um, that are unknown to, to um, the, the Jews and the Christians there. Um, but we entertain, like I said earlier, with the 124,000 number, we entertain the possibility that the origins of other faiths, like Hinduism and Buddhism, um, uh, may have some divine origin, but that can't be confirmed. And uh, the extent of... Uh, one of the, the, another important thing, Islam holds that there, with the passage of time, sort of like, a, to use an analogy, like a building, you can have sort of decay, and it can become a ruin after a while, etc. You can have an alteration. You can have... Um, the the, uh, the uh, integrity of the message change with time. Messages change with time. And this is something well documented in religious studies. Um, and so uh, we don't know which aspects of a particular teaching are the original, which ones are new and introduced uh, over time by clerics of different sorts, etc. So generally speaking, um, they have had... Uh, well, they've lived... Muslims have tended to live in great harmony with other religions historically. Um, I personally not a great fan of the 20th century. I like to like look at everything before the 20th century. I mean, just worldwide, all of us, right? Just the whole globe. Um, if you look at Muslim majority nations, you'll find non-Muslim minorities there. You'll find churches. You'll find temples. You'll find synagogues. Synagogues. You'll find Hindu temples. You'll find Buddhist statues. All of these. In fact, all these things that crazy ISIS is destroying. Ask yourself how it's still there to be destroyed in the first place. 
Like that's just a really just a very basic thing of like, oh, wait, they're destroying it, and but Muslims have been in control there for 14 centuries, and it's still there for these idiots to destroy. <laughs> Clearly, it survived somehow, right? Um, so that 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 is tended to be there. Now, that's not to say people aren't humans and there haven't been skirmishes and strife, but that typically is more political and not um, an inescapable part of religion. So I hope I answered that. This last one, and I'm going to try to be brief, but this is something that um, I think is a little more sensitive and requires a bit of context. So, And the reason I'm saying that is I see about four questions all on the same topic. And these are questions of, do Muslims accept or not accept homosexuality? Is there anything in the Quran that bans it, or is it mainly a cultural issue? How are issues of the LGBTQ community viewed by Islam? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's the general gist of the question, kind of phrased in different ways. Uh, I would say that in order to understand this from a Muslim perspective, you sort of have to try to put away the baggage of how this has historically been dealt with here, um, because I think we tend to see religion as viewing it in a particular way. Uh, I would say that there's multiple levels to this. So on the, the Sharia level, the personal moral code, uh, Muslims have traditional Abrahamic morality, that the only um, act, uh, the only sexual act sanctioned is between a married couple. Um, and in fact, I think Islam would even be slightly more particular and say that, um, and I apologize for the um, explicit nature of this answer, but it's, it's the question at hand. Sodomy is even forbidden between a married couple, a man and a woman. This is something that's categorically forbidden uh, for Muslims. But that's on the level of, of, of moral code. So Muslims hold that the only condoned sexual act is between a married couple um, and anything outside of that, the, the, the man and the woman, anything outside of that uh, would be forbidden. So that's on the level of moral code. But so what does that mean philosophically? Because I think sometimes, um, if we're really honest, religion has had uh, an interesting history vis-a-vis uh, -vis this issue that is very charged. Does that mean that God hates me? Does that mean that God... Um, created me this way, am I condemned to hell, right? What does this mean philosophically? Muslims would hold that we are, first and foremost, we're our souls, right? That we're not defined by our passions. And everybody has a different set of passions, a different set of, uh, you guys remember how we were talking about the character? Of course you remember, because that was my part of the talk. <laughs> right? That it's about, it's about resisting the temptations of the ego, right? We all are inherently built with that. There are heterosexual impulses that must be I mean, that's why adultery is one of the, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? Those impulses must be resisted, um, and, and uh, a person is not defined by their temptations. Now, we do, Muslim scholarship has accepted that this has been something that has existed in humanity for millennia, that there are people who have an inclination, um, a temptation towards the same gender, um, but that's why you will find, and I actually know several personally, celibate gay Muslims who just say, well, I'm, I'm not attracted to the other gender, I'm attracted to my own gender, but I believe that God doesn't permit it, um, so I, I'm just, I will commit myself to a life of celibacy. They are not defined by that. Muslims don't see them as, oh, like, what's wrong with you? There's something, in fact, in my own personal experience, they tend to be celebrated, because that's a, that's a pretty, like, that's a pretty difficult thing to do, particularly, that, that is a jihad of sorts. Um, and I, I've got one more thing to add about jihad, by the way. Um, but it's, it, is, it is something that we are to do. We, part of the surrender to God is to follow God's commandments. Um, and, and it's hard for us to accept because I think sometimes popular culture tells us we have to just embrace our passions. And that's sort of what we, they, we are, our, our impulses and passions. So we have to embrace them. Um, whereas Islam would say, mm, we're a little more complex, we're composite, right? And you do have some passions, but sometimes those are the things you should not be listening to. Um, and you are your soul, and you have a higher nature, and God is, is, is going to lay out the criteria for how you should live your life. You could be in love with a married woman, right? You don't act on that. That's called, that. yeah, tough luck, right? You sort of struggle with that. Socially, Muslims really see um, sexuality as something private. Anything, whether it is permissible and proper or illicit, is really just is keep it in the bedroom. It's almost, it's just, it, it really, to preserve the decency of society. Um, and, and a lot of these questions about hijab and dress, you know, uh, if you think about how people dressed 100 years ago, I don't think women in headscarves would have stuck out in 19th century America, right? 19th century England, right? Where people wore, you know, bond. I mean, you you we can you, you watch these time pieces, right? These movies, and you're like, wow, like that's nice. 
people, peasants wore three-piece suits with ties. Like, what happened to that, right? So I think all, sexuality was also something deemed very improper to bring into public, whether it was homosexual or heterosexual. So generally speaking, that's something socially kept private. But communally, and I think this does uh, bear saying, communally, how do we get along? This is an important thing. How can those of us who hold different opinions coexist with mutual respect? So simply because a Muslim believes God has forbidden something in their personal moral code, does that equate that we're now, we have to sort of clash and we have to disrespect one another? Absolutely not. And a Muslim would stand in the defense of any abuse, any intolerance, any attacks, any uh, based on any belief somebody has, right? Now, somebody here might think, and I wouldn't be upset about it, by the way, that I'm, we're all condemned to hell because we haven't accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I shouldn't be offended by that. As long as we can respectfully have a dialogue, why should a belief about what I, you know, about what attains salvation in the hereafter offend me? Um, 